My name is Karis. Join with us as we search through the scriptures. I invite you to make your way this morning as we go through God's word today to the book of Genesis once again. Hopefully you're following along kind of along the linear timeline of how we're walking through and going through the word of God today. Over the last several weeks and the last couple of years as we process through this today, we're going to focus specifically on the next three weeks, unless God changes our minds, we're going to look at and go through and see and talk about Noah and the ark and his family and the, the framework that we have there. The next three or four weeks, that will be our focus. And uh, we'll process through and learn a few things as we worship through God's word. And so Genesis chapter 6, we're going to read the first eight verses. Verses 1 through 8 will be our launch pad for today. Out of respect for the holy, living, inerrant word, I would invite you, if you're able to, to stand for its reading. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. If you're ready for God's word, would you say, Amen. Amen. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. They took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not strive with man forever, because he is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore children to them. Those were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of his thought of his heart was towards evil continuously. The Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth. He was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, for I am sorry I have made them. But Noah found grace, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Father, today, our prayer is that you would allow us in our opportunity of your word to see your face. Glean better understanding of who you are, what you've called for us to do, how that you interact with us. Lord, may we look at the pages of scripture today, not as a children's story, but may we hear and understand the word of God and what it can mean for us in our lives today. God, be with me as my prayer that I would be able to preach what you've laid upon my heart. May anything that would come from me not be heard or remembered. But may today all that we know, hear, and understand is thus saith the Lord our God. This is our prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. And you may be seated today. If you're taking notes, if you, if you want to... Flip your bulletin over on the back side. If you're bringing a notebook, whatever, however you choose to take notes, maybe you just remember it all and, and don't need to. However it works for you, it's great. You can do whatever you think you need to. But if you need a sermon topic, it's in your bulletin. But with, uh, before we can get to the ark, we have to understand why the ark was needed. God didn't just one day go, hey, by the way, I think today we're going to have an ark. God didn't just on the fly go, one day we need something. I'm bored in heaven and need something to do because there's not enough for me to take care of. No, there was a need that was there. There was a functional need that was there that we, before we can get to the ark and the rainbow in two by two, we need to understand the why, the reason, the need for it. And how in the world does that relate to us today? And that's going to be our focus and, and our, 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 the, the crux of who we are. And it's amazing to me how that we go from the, the end of chapter 4 with men began to call upon the name of the Lord to chapter 6 where everything is evil. Men began to call upon the name of the Lord. What a great promise. What a great note. What great hope. 
And within chapter 5, as you walk through the, the generations that are listed there, we, we move through time and move through time, and we find a great promise there with Enoch and the understanding of who he was and how he lived and what happened with him, where God took him. And over and over again, we see, and he died, 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 and death, and death, and death. And we find ourselves in the place where that Noah and his story the, the revelation of Noah and his family, Noah and the ark, come on the scene. But if we're not careful, we miss a few things. And we want to go straight into the end of 6 and into 7 and 8. And all we want to talk about is the boat and the animals. When we began to move the, the library from out of the, the two or three rooms it was in into one room and consolidate and, and uh, make everything a little more accessible, a little easier to get to, we found, I guess in 2012, it predates us being here, there was some sort of Noah's Ark something. I don't know if it was a competition. I don't know if it was somebody. I, I don't know what it was. But we have Noah's Ark stuff running literally out of the walls. Stuff hanging on walls. I don't know who did it, but they deserve large kudos because somebody crocheted an ark, and it's not this big. Is that who it was? It was your mama? It's this big and this tall, and it's got wire running through it, and it's got sparkly thread. It is a marvelous piece of crochet engineering. We've got paintings. We've got stuff cut out of wood. There's all kinds of Noah's Ark stuff there. But you know what none of them show? Nobody's dying. There's no evil. All it is is Mr. and Mrs. Noah. And he's got a beard and a stick. And there's a giraffe with a head up over here. And there's an elephant trunk sticking out. And there's a zebra head. Because that's all we want to talk about when we talk about Noah. And we miss out on some things and we don't understand fully what the, the ark represented. And so before we can get to that, we have to move backwards just a little bit and see what the need for the ark was. And so I want us to look today at this passage and get a few things out of it. And as we began to look at the need for the ark, it, we, we know and understand it was needed because of a few things. Three things this morning. Why did they need the ark? Why did they need something put into place? Why did God make condemnation? Three things from the scriptures this morning I want you to see. Number one, they needed the ark. The ark was needed. There was condemnation because of wrong choices. Verse number two, the sons of God, the daughters of men, who they were, we won't go through. I'll let you read and decipher that for yourself. I have my opinions on what it is, but that is not the important part. The important part is the last part of the verse. Whomever they chose. They did whatever they wanted to do. Did you see that? It's not about where they said, okay, God, should I do this? No, they came and said, God, this is what I am going to do. Now bless me. They said, here is what I want to do. Here is what looks right to me. Here is what is appealing to me. And they didn't learn anything from, from Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. Now we're not very far into, into you know, timeline here. But we've already had several examples, have we not, of when you choose against God, God doesn't like it. And when you choose the things God likes, he approves. Humanity and all of us fall into that category. We are so slow to learn. If we would do stuff right the first time, we wouldn't have to go back and do it again. But most often, more often than not, we choose to do things either the easy way or the way that we want to. And not always doing things the easy way is the right way. 
Doing things the easy way does not always equate with God's way. Well, there's no friction here, so I must be doing the right thing. Since I'm not, you know, there's no problems with it, my faith is strong enough, I can just do this and do what I want to, and God will bless me. Isn't that what the Bible says? God will give you the desires of your heart. Doesn't that mean God gives you everything you want? Oh, but it's a Bible verse. It sounds a whole lot like what we read, <clears throat> you have not because you ask not. Now, see, people put a period there. If you just got enough faith, everything will be okay. Except that's not the end of the verse. That's not even the end of the sentence. You have not because you ask not. And you still have not because when you ask, you ask with the wrong motives. Well, how can it be the wrong motive? It's the desire of my heart, and God's going to give me the desire of your heart. Because it's not about you. We should seek after him. The scripture says, do all to the glory of yourself. Right? To the glory of social media. To the glory of getting your name in light somewhere. To the glory of a plaque that will hang on the wall in a church. Boy, that didn't get a whole lot of nothing. The glory of somebody saying yay. I think Jesus mentioned something about that in the book of Matthew. When the Pharisee was standing over in the middle of the temple, raising his arms and his eyes saying, thank you God for not making me like all these worthless people around me. And the tax collector was over in the corner beating his chest, tearing his clothes, saying, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, the one in the corner has gone home right with God. The one who everybody applauded after his prayer has received his reward already. And somehow in our righteous behavior and the decisions we make and the thoughts we make, and we say, well, and you've heard this before, maybe you've seen it in movies or on television programs, Perhaps you've heard someone pray this. I would dare not say that you've done it. But somebody in your, in your world that around you has maybe said this. God, if I'm not supposed to do this, don't let me. Let me just share something with you. God does not send a tax on his children. The only reason you're going to encounter friction in your Christian life is when you're doing something right and it stirs up the enemy. See, Satan has no reason to attack you if you're working for him. The only time attacks come are when people begin to do what God has called them to do. Well, this is sure is going easy. My life is, this is all wonderful. I'm doing doing this and I'm doing this and God must be blessing me because there's no problems. The absence of problem is not meaning that it is God's will. The peace in the middle of problems means it's God's will. That's why Jesus said, peace I leave with you. Not peace as the world understands or the world affords or the world gives, but the peace that only comes by me. That's why we have the parakletos. That's why we have the, the helper, the comforter, the one who provides peace. That's why the peace of God that passes all understanding is found only in Christ Jesus. Peace is only for those that are in conflict. And when we begin to make wrong choices, the devil has no reason to attack us. The armor of God is not for those who are not in the fight. Why did they need the ark? Why do we come back and look at this? Why do we see this? It's because what they were doing was not walking with God. When you walk with God like Enoch did, he takes you out, not away, but home. So you don't have to put up with all of this stuff. God protects his children, takes care of his children, loves his children. We just sang that song. Hallelujah, what a savior. Why? Because he's saving, helping, keeping, and loving. And he will be with me until the end because nothing can separate me from the love of God. 
But as Isaiah chapter 1 says, if we are rebellious and disobedient, we will be devoured by the sword. When we begin to make choices that are wrong, we cannot expect for God to lavish his love on us. They began to make choices that were violating the very nature and essence of God. And quite literally, in the scripture, in this that we just read, it broke God's heart. Why? Because it is the desire of God's heart that all should come to salvation and grow in the knowledge of truth. And when we make poor choices and wrong choices, it causes a problem and we choose for ourselves. And when we choose for ourselves, we know, and you've heard this and I've referenced this and you know this passage of scripture, the proverb says, the way that seems right to a man leads to destruction, to death. It leads us away from God. How do we know that? Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray, each of us to our own separate ways. And that's why the chastisement of our peace had to be upon Christ. That's why by his stripes and by his wounds, by what had happened to him, we are healed. Not physically. That, that doesn't talk about physical healing. What that talks about is the spiritual nature of who we are is brought back into alignment with him because of what Christ did. Suffered and faced, shed his blood, allowed his body to be placed into the middle of his creation, to be gloriously resurrected on the third day, was because we make choices that need a Savior. I know that this is not quite in line with what it looks like, but the understanding of us misyoked. You've heard that scripture and you read it in all throughout the, the New Testament. We talk about it and we talk about it in the, in the marriage sense, in the marriage context. That's what it is written for about being unequally yoked. But we need to understand there's a different terminology and a different connotation to what it means to be unequally yoked. It's not simply about a husband and wife relationship. These people that are here one is referenced as having a, a, a position with God. One is having a position on the earth. One is godly. One is godless. One is the children of Cain. One is the children of Seth. One is this group. One is this group. Whatever your terminology, whatever your belief is this, you know and understand something. There are two diametrically opposed forces that are joined together by their choice and it caused problems. I have a great soapbox and a great problem. And it may just be my personal opinion. I believe it's biblically based is this. The church should look different than the world. By language, by dress, by attitude, by concept, by functionality, by language, by dress, by code, by concept, by functionality, we should be different because the scripture says we are to be weird. Doesn't the Bible say peculiar? We should be different than everybody else. Why? Because if we're the same, what is the testimony? If I live exactly like the world, except I have to get up early on Sunday morning, what benefit is it to anyone? Man, I'd like to invite you to go to church with me. Why? You're worse than I am. Well, I go to church. So what? Going to church doesn't save you. I'm going to say this and move on. I know lost people that are better Christians than church people. Some of the worst letters, phone calls, visits that a Christian will ever receive are done by other Christians. Some of you have seen it. A man went to church for the first time in years. 
was there and his phone went off in the middle of church and he was embarrassed and people gave him ugly looks and was glaring at him and told him to hush and be quiet and da-da-da-da-da. He was distraught and after church he was kind of accosted by folks who said, make sure next time you turn your phone off. That evening, as was his custom, he went to the bar and he was still so shaken up he spilled his drink. The waitress came and said, that's okay, and cleaned it up, brought him a new drink on the house. Man, we're so glad you're here. Don't worry about it. Drink, just spend some time here. Take your ease. Is it any wonder he didn't ever go back to church again? We want to look so much like the world and act so much like the world that we just make earth a better place to go to hell from. Because we are misyoked. We are not in alignment with God's will. We make choices that cause problems. The need for the ark was not because people just acted funny. It's because they chose poorly. They misyoked themselves and followed after the creation rather than the creator. I think we read that in the book of Romans, if I'm not mistaken, in exchanging the truth of God for a lie. Number two, verse three. They were fleshly. (laughs) There is a, a real sense of contention This for us ought to be one of the scariest constructs in language that we can apply to the church today. God says in this verse that he will not contend with man forever. Romans said he will give people over to their reprobate mind. Revelation says God will come and he will remove the lampstand of his spirit for those who are unrepentant. How long can the church operate in its flesh and itself before God says goodbye? Some of you have been around, I've told you this, there was a a survey put out just a couple of uh, months ago, 13,000 pastors were interviewed, 13,000 pastors that belong to the same denomination we do, the Southern Baptist Convention, 13,000 pastors from all over the United States all took the same survey, 62% of them said, as the pastor of this church, they had not experienced a movement of God in their church. Ever. Not 62 people out of 13,000, 62% had never experienced a movement of God in their church. Well, that brings up a whole host of questions. Why? Do they not understand what salvation is? Do they not understand the role of the Spirit of God? Do they not understand their role as the preacher? Do they not understand the role of church members? Do they not understand the role of this? It doesn't matter the why. On this global scale, what matters is so often the choices that we make that are wrong lead to and invest in our flesh instead of our spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 18 talks about The fruit of the flesh, verses 522, the fruit of the Spirit. And as we begin to see and understand what this says about being flesh, temporal, corrupt, carnal, the the corruptibility of who we are, and what we have taken is we have taken what God has given us and we have distorted it. We live in a culture where that clear, wanton violation of God's word is okay because it's not true anyway. We have pastors and teachers and preachers who will stand and who will literally almost verbally rip pages out of Scripture because that's for old people or it doesn't matter anymore or that was written for another culture 
or when the Bible says you ought not do this, it's okay because that was written for this and let's try to explain away why that it's okay for us to involve ourselves in this even though the Bible clearly says we're not supposed to and it's an abomination and it's wrong and we should have nothing to do with it, but we will do it because we're choosing to ignore the Word of God. And we are taking and corrupting the very fabric of who God is for our own pleasure. The scripture says that God said, I'm not going to fight with him forever. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to strive. I'm not going to contend forever. As we begin to corrupt, God says, I'm going to I'm going to leave and take my spirit elsewhere. And it's done and it's hinged on that fact that we have traded the truth of God for a lie. When you look at the word of God and you begin to say, this is not enough. This is not good enough. This is not right enough. And we look at the word of God and we say, I like this verse, but not this one. Some of you have probably heard of the Jesus Project. Not the Jesus Video Project. That was different. The Jesus Project was they got a whole group of scholars together. And we'll use that term very loosely. We'll put air quotes, or y'all know what this means, right? Scholars together. And they brought in a bunch of university fellows and a bunch of eggheads and a bunch of guys who wore glasses, and they said, here, we're going to talk about this. And they went back, and they began to devolve, and they began to go through the New Testament. And they said, we're going to pick and choose, and we're going to decide what Jesus really said, what he might have said, What we're pretty sure he didn't say, but it's still good. And what he did not say, it's absolutely made up. And they took the Lord's Prayer. And they had colored beads. Red was for something that that Jesus said. And it graduated through the colors. And black was something Jesus absolutely did not say ever. It was made up. And as they began to go through, and this is not something that um, you can go online, Google this, and they, you'll be able to find it. The only thing that they agreed upon that Jesus actually said in the, in the model prayer was this, our Lord in heaven. That's all Jesus really said. Why? Well, that doesn't align with some this, and that doesn't do this, and... Well, you know, the language that's there, Jesus would never have said that because um, Jesus wouldn't have known anything about that. That didn't exist. And they exchanged the truth of God. Of thus saith the Lord. Every word of God has been tested and proven true. Every word of God is perfect. Perfect. Every word that proceeds from his mouth will not return to him void, but will accomplish what it has been set forth to accomplish. When you start being able to say, this doesn't mean what it means, Hebrews chapter 2 becomes a, a, a very viable thing for us because it says, how will we neglect so great a salvation which was spoken first by God? If you cannot trust the word of God on page 4, how do you trust the word of God for your salvation? We have corrupted, they had corrupted all of the things that God had given, they had destroyed. Point number three, verse number five. This is one of the most heart-wrenching verses in all of the scripture. By the way, this isn't the, this isn't the last time this verse appears. God said, every inclination of man's heart is toward evil continuously. The Lord saw wickedness. That word there in the Hebrew translates best to anti-godness. God looked and he saw this. Stuff that was against who he is. We ask that question, especially with, with, with younger children, with young teens. 
if, if they come and they want to have a conversation about being baptized and we have to take it back a step and talk about salvation first and we begin to look and get an understanding of what salvation really is. And the question is this, what is sin? If you can't tell me what sin is, then we need to have a longer conversation. But the reality is this, so many times when we talk to especially younger children, what is sin, their explanations are this, well, I didn't make my bed. And there's a legitimacy to that because when we hear in Sunday school or VBS or in church or children's church or whatever, we talk about sin is stuff that God doesn't like, stuff that makes people unhappy, stuff that is wrong or a, it's a breaking of the rules. And if the rule is every morning you get up and you've got to do this and this and this, you've got to make your bed, you've got to brush your teeth, you've got to you know, run a comb through your hair, you've got to get dressed, you've got to make sure that you've got your backpack, you've got to go to school, whatever it is. And we begin to equate sin with not following the rules of making the bed. And there's a problem there because that's not, at, that's not accurate. And we begin to have to explain what it means for sin to be anything that is against the nature of God. See, sin is not just simply stuff God doesn't like. Sin is things that violate his very nature. This is why lying is bad. Because it violates the nature of truth that God is incarnate. Truth, you, you remember that, right? Jesus in John 14, 6 said, I am the way, the truth. Not a truth, but the truth. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 tells us God is love. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love always rejoices in truth. Jesus said in John chapter 17, the Holy Spirit was coming and he was going to lead you into all Truth. Second Timothy, first Timothy chapter two says this the desire of God's heart all should come to salvation and grow in the knowledge of truth. Truth is absolutely essential to the very nature and very DNA fabric of who God is. So lying isn't just because it makes God sad. Lying is a direct violation of the nature of the God who lives inside of you if you are a Christian. This is is what it means for every inclination of the heart to be towards evil continuously. It is not just something that is an every now and occurrence. It is an everlasting problem that we have. It is the, real, the result of the sin of Adam that infests us. It is, as Hebrews tells us, the sin that so easily besets us. It is the sin that we love so much Christ had to die to redeem us out of. I believe it is the King James that reads verse 5, and it says, every inclination of man's heart. The New American Standard says the intent. Some of the other versions use the term desire. One of them uses the term want. It is the want of man's heart. The thing that is grasped for. is what we seek after is towards evil continuously. Jesus makes reference to this in the New Testament in the Gospels when he said this, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because it's not about what we say we believe, it's what we do that proves what we actually believe. And when we choose to do the wrong things based in our flesh, what we wind up with is the result of poor choices made by sinful flesh. Why? Because it's who we are. It's who they were. Why did they need the ark? Why did they need God to make a way out I'm a believer in this. Noah preached while they were building the ark. Told them what was going to happen. I mean, you, you need to understand just very briefly, the, the scripture, there was no rain before the flood. It was a mist that came up from the ground. It's going to rain. There's going to be a flood. What does that mean? 
He's explaining, he's telling him what God has said, what God has done. They're making fun of him. 120 years arguing, fighting, contending for the faith, as it were. And yet what we read and know and understand, according to Peter's writings, there were eight souls aboard the ark. It means somebody made a poor choice. The ark was there and established to protect. I'm reminded of that language when Jesus said, wide is the way and broad is the path that leads to destruction. Many are going to find it, but narrow is the way. Tiny is the path that leads to salvation, leads to the kingdom of God, leads to everlasting life, whatever your version says. And only a few are going to find it because the mouth speaks, the body acts. We make the choices based on what's in here. If we don't put enough of God's word in here, we act like we don't have enough of God's word in here. And we, just like the people in Genesis chapter 6, need an ark, as it were. What does all this mean for us today? It's very simple. We're wicked-hearted choosers of the flesh. It's not great grammar, but I think it's real. The scripture, the scripture says, and I think the writer of the hymn, Just As I Am, um, pins the, the verse, we are poor, wretched, pitiful, and blind. I'm glad for the verse that says that God takes care of the simple. Because in the best that we can do being filthy rags, the best we can do and bring him is nothing more than who we are and we can't do enough. This becomes the reality of my favorite verse of the scripture. Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The understanding of what Jesus did for us is exactly what we read in verse number 8 of this passage. Jesus died, was put into the ground, was gloriously resurrected on the third day to give us grace. Isn't that what the scripture says? The old, remember the old Southern Gospel song? I grew up not knowing anybody else but the Statler brothers sang it. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In that high tenor part. Oh, Noah. And he holds it out while they're all singing the desk. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we, I, I never knew anybody else sang that but them. And I began to, when you read the, the lyrics of that song, they're taken very closely and appropriately out of the scriptures. God spoke to Noah. Noah responded. Noah did. Noah did this. God said. Everything puts together. But it all found and is encapsulated in this verse. And the same thing holds true for us today. God's grace is meted out upon us the same way it was meted out upon Noah. If we will just simply choose to follow the word of God, grace is ours for the receiving All Noah had to do was spend 120 years with his, with his sons and build a boat in the middle of the desert. We've got the better end of this bargain, by the way. Because all we have to do is confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. We don't have to wait 120 years. It's instantaneous. And the grace of God is imparted into our lives. I think that that is the absolute greatest hope, the greatest verbiage, the greatest understanding in our lives. Now, we cannot appropriate that verse for ourselves. We're, we don't, we don't, 
That's not written about us. But I understand this. Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, talk about who we are in Christ. And how we used to be dead in trespass and sin. Alienated, not partakers of the promise, not joint heirs, not co-heirs. We are completely abandoned, completely set aside. We have absolutely no hope. And then there is that two-word phrase, but God. I know that today, this hasn't been a very pleasant message. So let me just final, finalize it with great hope. If you are lost without Christ, there is grace available for you. If you are saved and are struggling in your life and your calling and your faith in, in, in making your faith your own faith and not the faith of somebody else, there is grace for you. If you are saved and under the blood of Christ, but have stepped out and have walked away and have said, I'm going to follow and I'm going to make poor choices, I'm going to follow the flesh, and you've wound up far afield and don't know how to get back, there is faith, there is grace, there is the mercy of God, the Spirit of God available for you because he has looked upon mankind and there is grace in the eyes of God. Today, you may just need to be reminded of the grace that God has already given you and rejoice in your salvation. Today may be a day that you need to experience the grace of God in its fullness for the first time and come in just a few moments and say, Brother David, I don't know what's going on, but I need to ask some questions about grace. I need to come in to pray. I need to come and join the church. I need to come and just find out what it is God is speaking to me. In just a few moments, we're going to stand, we're going to sing, and we're going to participate in responding to the will of God. I will remind you that our time of invitation, our time of response is not a time to get ready to leave. You can take your time after we're finished to get ready to leave and visit with your neighbor. The time of responding to God's word is not just for those who need to walk the aisle. The time of response are for those who need to take a knee in the altar and begin to pray. Those who need to visit with the neighbor and begin to pray. Those who need to come to the altar and pray. It's not about just coming down and confessing gross, wanton sin. It can simply be coming and saying, I need to pray for my neighbor across the street who needs to receive Christ as their Savior. If you're on right standing with God, you pray for those who are not. If you're not, you pray that God would open your eyes to make a way for you to be back in his grace, as it were. I'm going to invite our ladies to come now. I'm going to say this. <clears throat> the Bible says all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of that sin is death, eternal separation from the very God who is our life. And if you will just simply make confession and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved.